You know, sometimes we have guests here on the Exam Room Podcast that are inspirational. Other times we have guests that are educational. They talk all things plant-based nutrition. They give you the tools that you need to succeed when it comes to your health. And then we have today's guest who kind of combines all of that and a whole heck of a lot more. She is quite literally the most fascinating human being on the face of the earth. <laughs> she is the CEO. I mean, get this. I mean, her credentials just go for days. She is the CEO of Green Mustache Cafe that is near Vancouver. Uh, she is the founder, the proprietor of Richer Health. She has a new documentary coming out. She's an author of the book, Eat Real to Heal. She's a doctoral student. She's a speaker. She is pretty much Wonder Woman. And with that, we welcome Nicolette Richard to the exam room. Uh, wow, what a resume. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks very much. I was only Wonder Woman once, and that was for Halloween one year. Great costume, great costume. Oh, you don't need the costume. You're Wonder Woman every day. Like, you're Wonder Woman right now. Let me let me just tell you, like, the amount of things that you do to bring forward such a healthy message into the world is second to none. It's wondrous that you can do it all. Well, I have a team, so I have to, you know, give a shout out to them because they are amazing. Like our staff come from all over the world to work for us. And that's because they have the biggest hearts and they want to change the world as well. So we're lucky. So definitely. And my husband, my husband's my business partner. He left teaching to come join me. And so big shout out to him as well. There you go. Can't leave the old hubs off the list. No. <laughs> um, let's, uh, we're, I'm just, for those who are watching, those who are listening, we're going to bounce around. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff today. Like today is just generally going to be a talk show, uh, but it's going to be a heck of a ride. So stay with us. I think that this is going to be a whole lot of fun. Um, I want to start with um, BIPOC health. Um, yeah. In the in the US, I mean, we, we I, I don't want to say that we have this notion that the issues is as far as equality are limited to within our borders but certainly um we may feel like the issues are the worst here and then when i look at what it is that you're doing up in canada and you're talking about a lot of the issues that are facing people of color north of the u.s border i'm like wow it really is not just an exclusive American problem here. So when it comes to disparity and health, what type of challenges are people of color facing right now in Canada? Well, it's the same as in the U.S. And definitely this goes back to a huge history, long history of colonization. And so, you know, black people, uh, people of color, indigenous people, um, Asian, um, there's still racism is rampant everywhere we go. But when you actually dive into the way that uh, BIPOC uh, individuals live, this is where you really get to see that disparity. And it's because many were pushed off their lands. They had direct connection to the land, to growing food, to hunting and gathering. Um, and then as a result of colonization, they were pushed onto the worst lands possible. So they couldn't grow food. They were forced to farm in the most extreme conditions. And many of them still live in these communities because that's where their communities were all forced together. And so they don't have access to food. So they live in what's known as food deserts. And this means that, you know, you and I, check, we could probably go to the next Whole Foods a few minutes away from our house and we can get, you know, organic apples and, and lettuce and potatoes and squash that was probably not picked too long ago. Whereas in these food deserts, a lot of BIPOC people that live in remote and rural communities like this, and there's a lot of them across Canada, um, they can't even buy banana. And if they do, they're generally doing their grocery shopping in a gas station and paying up to $10 for that banana. Okay, hold on. $10 for a single banana? Yep. And a lot of them, they have to have their produce shipped such over such a long distance. Um, and that by the time, like, for example, you know, a, a quart of milk even would cost, it's such, it's such extreme prices that you and I will never have to pay that price for. I mean, not that we're drinking milk, but, you know, eat like almond milk, whatever it is, you know, it's just so expensive for them to get food. And the, the stuff that they have access to, I can't even call it food because it's all hyper refined, hyper processed, um, you know, really, truly some of the, the worst food that any human can consume. Yeah, I hear you talking about that. And it reminds me of the stories that I hear talking to people 
uh, who, who are indigenous, you know, and, and they, they too live on these food deserts and they, they live in these enormous sections of land here in the U S but I mean, we're talking like the size of a state, state and a half. And yet there are only three grocery stores, full grocery stores for this entire population. And so some of them will organize a bus trip just so they can go to the, uh, to the grocery store. And that is mind blowing. I have never known that way of living. And I'm not even sure that the average person could be thrown into that environment and quite know what to do. Exactly. And, and you really, sometimes you just can't do anything. Like if you think about, you know, the fact that, you know, you're taking care of your kids, uh, low income, so you might not even be able to afford the bus ride in. And so you're just kind of at the mercy of whatever's available at the local gas station. And, and that's the kind of food that you eat. It's um, and, and also even just talking about the quality of their land, some people might say, well, you know, why don't they just grow food? And it's not that easy because, you know, 400 years ago, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, even in just the last like 60 years, people were still being pushed off their land onto the worst land that where the soil has been completely degraded, nothing grows there. And then saying, well, you need to start farming, whereas farming actually can bring up a lot of trauma in BIPOC members because they were forced to farm for the settlers, right? So it brings up a lot of trauma and they never got to access the food that was grown on these farms anyway. They were just thrown the scraps. Living in that type of environment, I would imagine that the rates of chronic disease that we talk about here on the show all the time and we try to combat with food, I would imagine that those rates of disease are much higher compared to the public at large. Yeah, so the rates of diabetes, and that's a really good point, the rates of diabetes in non-Indigenous communities or in Indigenous communities compared to non-Indigenous communities is sometimes up to four to eight times higher. And then you can look at the same statistics for heart disease, for mental health, and of course, we're seeing the rise of autoimmune disorders happening as well. And so, yeah, they're definitely um, um, affected at much, much higher levels. And it's not a genetic thing. That's the important thing to understand. It is purely from the lifestyle that they were forced into. And and being forced into that lifestyle, I mean, you have all of these diseases that accompany that. I would imagine that the life expectancy also would be significantly lower um, yeah, we're than seeing, what you and I are facing. Oh, yeah. We're seeing greater than 10 years uh, difference. And that is statistically significant. You know, often when we talk about the difference in life expectancy, we can expect to shave off, you know, in a lot of studies, it'll be shaving off a few hours to maybe a few weeks or a few months, but 10 years is, is significant. You know, and speaking with John Lewis and Keegan Kuhn recently, who put out the amazing documentary, They're Trying to Kill Us, um, outside of food deserts, they also focused on impoverished areas where, uh, again, uh, even though you have a lot of people here uh, in, in a major city, uh, you do not have a major healthy grocery store. I'm not even talking about Whole Foods. I'm talking, again, about a run-of-the-mill grocery store. And so they were pointing out that those two uh, could be considered a food desert because all you have are basically uh, the gas station food that, that we were talking about. But then this plethora of fast food restaurants where you and I both know, I mean, you, you eat that stuff. Also, your rates of chronic disease go incredibly high. The rate of obesity, diabetes, cancer, and, and so on and so on, incredibly high. Are people in Canada, I, I, I mean, this sounds like a stupid question, but I would imagine, again, this too is not a problem that is exclusive to the United States. No, and this is really all over the world. This is in Australia, it's in New Zealand, it's, you know, Europe has really dense populations and they have a much longer history. And obviously Europeans were the colonizers. So, you know, they're not going to be as effective, but it's still the same in any place where there are people of color, indigenous members. And so in Canada, it's exactly that. And you even see it, and this is the sad thing, you know, I was, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about this, but um, I'm training to run and bike across Canada. And this summer I did, or last summer, I should say, I did a run bike tour across BC. And it was sad because I live in, you know, just outside of Vancouver. In Vancouver, you can get all the organic plant-based whole food that you want. So, like it is everywhere. And you go a few hours outside of the city and you go into the interior and you see that 
there'll be what we have here is a and w fast food mcdonald's in every town but all of a sudden it was so hard for us to find you know fresh food like to find romaine lettuce to find kale and chard but we can find all the wine we wanted so it's not just in um, you know, remote and rural communities, these are pretty big cities I was going through and you still couldn't find healthy food, all fast food, no healthy food. So, uh, I mean, you're in that position, obviously you're, <laughs> I mean, you're exercising like a fiend at that point. Like what, what did you do to make sure that you had something healthy? Would, I mean, did you guys just load up and carry coolers with you wherever you went? Yeah, we had, uh, and we had to plan ahead. So anytime we were coming into a new town, we would definitely look to see what grocery stores they had, where we could get fresh produce, um, and then call ahead just to see if they can order some in. We had all of our dry goods already in our trailer stock. So all the rice and the beans and the quinoa and the grains and things like that. Um, and then for the fresh stuff, we just had to, sometimes you just eat an abundance of three different things as opposed to what we're used to is you know, we can get 50 different um, types of, you know, tomatoes and broccoli and, and cabbages and everything normally, but we would just have to, you know, do with, make do with what we had. Uh, let's switch gears here and, and talk a little bit about you here. Cause we're talking about, uh, <laughs> I mean, your, your bicycle, uh, you know, biking across the country, basically what you have coming up here, but, but the tour that you already did, um, Man, there was a time in your life, Nicolette, when you were not a bicyclist whatsoever. Uh, you were always big on on healthy eating, at least, uh, but you weren't necessarily moving your body. So how did you transition from being rather sedentary to being able to pedal for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers? Yeah, that came about a couple of years ago, just before uh, I was 19 or 19, 2019. And, you know, just the year before COVID hit. And, you know, my staff really noticed that I was sitting at my desk a lot. And that was standard for me, I could work for 10 hours straight, if I had to, you know, I would drop the kids at school, sometimes they have extracurricular activities after school. So I might not pick them up until seven. Um, and I could be sitting in my chair from eight in the morning, nine in the morning till seven at night. And the staff and my staff are amazing. Our restaurants just around the corner. So they would go to the green mustache and bring me healthy food all the time. Um, but it really got to the point where I was, we were up two flights of stairs and I make it to the top of the stairs and I would be out of breath. Like my lungs would be burning. And because I eat well, it's on the exterior, you know, I, probably was a few pounds overweight, definitely. But you know, most people would have said I was healthy. And I was healthy because of my diet, but I had zero movement. And I got a tracker, um, a Fitbit watch just to see how many steps I was taking in a day. And I was getting not even 1200 steps in in a day. Wow. Yeah, the minimum being probably 10,000 steps is what you're what you're going for. So I knew I had to do something different. I had three kids running lots of businesses, helping other people get healthy. And it just really, I hit that point where I just felt like a hypocrite, you know, getting my clients healthy meanwhile, my health was suffering. And so that's when I needed to knew I needed to do something to get myself moving. But if you know me, you know that I don't do anything in a little bit. It has to be. <laughs> big. And so I had just one day had this idea to, you know, do something big. So run and bike a long distance, because I knew that would motivate me to get out of my office chair, it needed to be something huge. And so I hired a trainer. And, you know, she helped me heal my back, um, helped me heal my knees, because my knees were creaking. Um, I literally was like a 80 year old, unhealthy woman, okay, in a 46 year old body at the time. And so then with just healing my injuries in the gym through physical training, that took about six months. That's how bad my body was. And then I hired a coach. Um, a lot of you know Rich Roll, and I had heard his podcast so many times, and his podcast that he does with his own coach, Chris Hout. And so I called up Chris, and I explained who I was and what my mission was, 22 million strong. Um, and so he took me on, and he just 
like put me through the grinder six days a week of training. Uh, we started really slowly in the beginning, like with, you know, run walking and, you know, I'd never been on a road bike before. So my initial road bikes were like 45 minute biking, like very small. And then by the end I was training 16 hours a week and, uh, and in a, quite a short time too. And some of my longest training days were about five hours long of, you know, just being on the road bike for five hours or doing like 21 K runs. And, um, yeah. And it just like, if I can do it, I can tell you this, anybody can do it. Cause I'm a pretty stubborn person. I'm a workaholic. Um, and I say that, you know, in the sense that I am truly, am a workaholic that where sometimes I work so much that I can forget about everything else, including my own health. So if I can do it, definitely, you know, other people out there can do the same thing that I did. Uh, how are, how are the knees now? Are you still have some crepitus in there? Or is that all cleaned up? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. My knees are, I feel like I'm a brand new body, brand new human. They don't creak. They don't hurt. Um, yeah, my body is in unbelievable shape. Love to hear that. And and yeah. how do you how do you balance that now? I mean, because clearly you still have 18 million projects going on, <laughs> but you're also prioritizing your health and, and staying active. So how is yeah. this balance happening? Yeah, so it, I'm glad that you asked that because right now it's not because I did the <laughs> bike run tour for 30 days uh, back in July and then came home and we were, it had the entire film crew uh, living with us because we were making a documentary. So my training, I took a break from training. That was just to let my body recover because when you're doing, you know, 100 kilometers a day for 30 days, your body definitely needs to recover. And then right when I came out of recovery, it's that's when the snow starts to fall, minus 20 weather. And so now I'm just getting back into it. And the way I balance it is, um, you know, just doing as much as I can indoors. And, you know, you have to, I have to set a timer. If I don't set a timer, I will not do it. I will not schedule it. Um, sometimes my, you know, kids will train with me because I have three girls, two of them are teenagers. And even my youngest one, you know, will put out the yoga mat. And so that if I'm on my bike riding or go up for a run with the dogs, I mean, you just have to you just have to schedule it like that's the way you do it and what's amazing is that you get so much energy from moving your body that it actually makes you more efficient in your work life and in your relationships as well that you have tons of energy for all of that as well so it's this beautiful relationship of you know putting out energy to get energy yeah, it's such an interesting concept is that if you, you take time away from the desk after spending so many hours there every single day and you think there's no way I can possibly get as much, if not more accomplished by taking time away from the desk. And yet you go, you take care of your body, that efficiency, as you just said, just kind of kicks into overdrive. That's it. It, it just seems so backwards, but it's so true. Yeah, 100%. Two ways to get mental clarity so that you operate efficiently is to eat clean, real food because that heals your microbiome, which then fuels your brain, gives you the energy that you need. And then moving your body, you get to clear that stagnant energy. It just like sends all the endorphins to your brain, which ma makes you like on 100% high alert for everything, which is beautiful, but not from a fight and flight perspective. It's actually, you know, you are now on the offense, right? You are there. You can see everything in front of you. Your brain thinks clearly. You strategize way better. You sit down to write emails or reports. You're way more efficient. Um, and so you get mental clarity through moving your body as well. And that saves you hours and hours and hours of work. So uh, 100 kilometers per day, uh, for those of us who don't use the metric system in our daily lives, that's a little over 62 miles. And yeah. so uh, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, I encourage you think of a town that is 60 miles from where you are right now, or 100 kilometers from where you are right now. That is a that is an awfully long distance. So from here in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, 60 miles, if you go north, that almost puts you in Delaware. That's a good chunk past Baltimore if you're starting starting off in DC. That is a, that is a heck of a bike ride to be doing every single day. Um, and you said, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You said it took about six months to get your body built back up and, and ready to go. Correct. So six months to heal my injury. So if anybody out there has injuries that you think that you're going to be living with them for the rest of your life, you don't have to. I mean, the work I do is reversing arthritis or reversing, you know, all types of chronic illnesses, reversing, you know, if you have back pain for a 
tons of different reasons. Reasons when you heal your body, everything heals. So those injuries will go away. So it took me six months to strengthen the muscles that needed to be strengthened, to um, stretch the muscles that were too tight, that were throwing everything off balance. So six months of getting my body really three days a week in the gym, just in case you want to know how, how many hours I spent doing that. So just three hours a week I spent doing that. And then once I started running and biking, um, my body was ready for that. So no more back pain, no more knee pain, no more shoulder pain. Uh, that was uh, almost uh, one year, actually, probably about 10 months of running and biking to get me to the point where I can do that. Do you think had you not been eating that healthy diet that it would have taken even longer to get you to that point? I don't think my injuries would have ever healed because... Well, I knew my injuries were um, structural injuries. It wasn't chronic inflammation injuries. Um, and so mine were just structural. And by being in the gym and by, you know, again, aligning my whole body structurally, everything, all the pain went away. Whereas a lot of people have inflammatory injuries. So your knees are going to ache and throb because of chronic inflammation from a poor diet. And so um, and a lot of people think you can exercise your way out of a bad diet and you absolutely cannot. You'll never get rid of that inflammation. So I know a lot of endurance athletes that are just, you know, if they were to go out and do a 100K bike ride, they're not riding for another week. Like their body needs to regenerate and it's going to take them a week or two. So they can't be out there every single day. Whereas when you're eating a plant strong, plant-based diet, your body and the right amount of nutrients, that's critical. It has to be unrefined, unprocessed. Your body is regenerating every single night. So I could go out and do hundred K and Afterwards, I could go play with my kids in the park and, you know, go take the dogs for a walk. And the next morning I'd wake up and I felt brand new again. And that was because of my diet. A hundred percent. It's a pretty cool feeling, isn't it? Like that, that's, the that's the best. best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so let's, let's shift back to food. So you say mm -hmm. like you can't exercise your way out of a disease, um, but you can eat your way out of a disease in a lot of times. And one of the yeah. programs that you're working on right now, I think is brilliant. You are actually training chefs to prepare meals so that they then can start to use food as medicine. Talk to us a little bit about what it is you're up to. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that we found, so when I first started teaching people how to eat real to heal, my clients would come to me and they would say, we can't eat out anywhere. You're telling, you know, I'm telling my clients to eat these, you know, really clean meals, cooked food, raw food, eat it in abundance. You don't have to count calories. It just has to be clean, unrefined, unprocessed, which also means that you know, minimizing your refined oil intake, minimizing or eliminating your refined sugar and sodium intake. We have to get the salts right here. And so if most of you know any chef that's out there, most chefs use oil, sugar, and salt to flavor their food. And here I am teaching my clients to eliminate those things. So where do you go to get clean, real food that actually is responsible for reversing the chronic degenerative diseases in your body. You can't go anywhere. Barely any chefs cook that way. So our program is to work with the restaurant owners and their entire culinary team, their chef, their sous chef, line chefs, everybody, to um, get them to make recipes, menu items that they add to their menu that are going to be green mustache certified so that if you have diabetes, an autoimmune disorder, chronic inflammation, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, anything, you can go in and eat that meal and know that it's actually contributing to building your mitochondria, getting rid of the inflammation, getting rid of the acidity. It's at, you're going to leave that restaurant healthier than when you walked in just by eating that meal. What, what type of restaurants are we talking about here? Can this literally be any restaurant under the sun? It can be any restaurant under the sun. And one of the things, um, if you've ever eaten at the Green Mustache, in our, we have, you know, clients from all over the world because we are in a Whistler, so a resort community and Vancouver, which is a prime destina destination. So when our customers come and eat at our place and then they learn about why our food is different, they often write back to us and they're like, uh, there's no other restaurants 
in the world that are serving the clean food like you're serving. And that's because most, you know, even plant-based restaurants that are out there, they are deep frying their falafels. They are adding tons of salt. You know, they use um, cane sugar and, you know, corn syrup and all of these different th fillers and, and flours. Flour is a very much a refined food um, in their products. So they're not able to access this clean, real food in other places. So even the plant-based restaurants that are out there, we're going to be working with them to just level up their um, culinary skills so that they produce clean real food and then fine dining restaurants because you know French cuisine we all love to eat it it's delicious but at the same time I mean it's predominantly made out of all of the ingredients you know it's a high animal fat lots of dairy um, you know lots of butter lots of salt so we're going to be working with fine dining restaurants we're going to be working with restaurant chains so you know owners who own multiple different um, restaurants we're not going to be focusing on the fast food restaurants just yet because they have really big systems that are you know that's a big <laughs> shift the <laughs> shift to turn but there are going to be a few franchise chains that we work with that um, they know that they need to make these changes because um, let me put it this way. We're going to be working with anybody and everyone who is currently serving the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Meat Burger and who think that that is the epitome of health. We're going to go in there and we're going to transform their thinking about that. <laughs> there you go. Get them to that next level. Get yeah, them there. Exactly. Um, the cool thing, though, I will say this in defense of plant-based restaurants right now is if you go in there and you ask for the chef to cut out the oil, cut out the salt, cut out the sugar as much as they possibly can, nine yeah. times out of 10, they're going to be able to work with you, especially if they are a plant-based restaurant, because you're going to have a number of customers who do subscribe to the SOS way of eating. Um, so that that is definitely a plus. But I would imagine with your program, you're not just going to teach them how to take it out, but then how to make sure that the flavors stays as oh. rich and as tasty as ever. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up because if any, like for everyone who's listening right now, 100% you can go into any restaurant in the world and you just have to put your own health first. So you go in there with your values and you just share that with them in a very kind way. Like, hey, I really value my health. You know, I might have, you might share that you have a health condition. Just say, are, you know, are you willing to take out the products that you don't want and most chefs will do that for you because they want to serve you a meal and they want you to come back so put yourself first and you know it, it does take a bit of courage to do this but just go make the request if they say no just go thanks and go somewhere else that's all you need to do chef aj knows all about doing this she's the queen of teaching you, you how to order the food that you need uh, to keep you healthy now um, Plant-based restaurants, um, 100% will do that because they're already there and they understand that relationship between food and your health, which is fantastic. Um, there was another part of your question, Chuck, which I totally forgot that I wanted to address. Uh, let's see. Plant-based restaurants, SOS, they should be able to work with you, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah. Chef AJ brought that in. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we kind of covered it there. I, yeah. I don't know what the other angle was. I think that that was a pretty complete answer. Okay, great. Yeah, there was one other point, but maybe it'll come back to me. Well, I would like to make another point. Uh, yeah. I, I would love to see that uh, tried at McDonald's. Like, I would love it. Like, if somebody who's watching or listening right now, here's your exam room challenge for the day, boys and girls. <laughs> Go into McDonald's with your cell phone rolling and uh, try to order something without meat, uh, without dairy, uh, and, and that's low in fat, low in salt, low in sugar. Just see what happens. I would just love to see the face of the poor person who is working behind the counter that day. I think that this would just be absolutely fantastic. I think that is an amazing challenge. And the challenge with that, though, is that their food comes to the restaurant already pre-made, pre-packaged. You know, they, they don't have the ability to not add the salt because it already arrives at the McDonald's with that in. But you, oh, this is the point I want to bring up, is that one of the reasons why we're doing this, too, is because I am personally so sick and tired of going and getting a plant-based meal in a restaurant and they give me half a head of cauliflower or dry quinoa with baby carrots. Like, come on, people. We have 350,000 plant species on the planet that are edible, nutritious, and delicious. Chefs just need to know how to use them to combine them into a delicious way. So it's not about just having chefs make plant-based food. The food has to be highly nutritious and it has to be delicious. There you go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. I get, but, but, but going back to McDonald's, I mean, I just, I'm going to like, I got to set the bar really high here because you know, what, the, what the heck, you know, maybe the video goes viral and, and magic happens. I don't know. Yeah. I think that the only thing, honestly, that they would be able to do for you that 
at, at that point is just give you the lettuce, tomato, and onion that they otherwise would be putting on a hamburger. And yeah. that's that's pretty much that. Um, yeah. But hey, you never know until you ask, right? Stranger and you know things have happened. And that is a good idea that I think we have such an addiction to food. And one of the things we have to do is we have to break that addiction to the food. So that means if you were to go, if that's the only place you can go and eat, then just ask them to make you a tomato, lettuce, onion, and pickle sandwich, literally. Just onion. layers and layers of it and just eat that, you know, and that's how you start shifting your health. Yeah, you you stack up enough tomatoes on there. That can be the meaty portion of it. And you should exactly. be in pretty good shape. You still got the lettuce and the pickle as a topping. Maybe you can do a little mustard on top there, you know? Totally. It's yeah. not it's not that bad. <laughs> um, all right. Uh let's see here. We've been we've been rambling on uh for quite a while, but I I, I gotta ask you about the documentaries um that you have coming up. Yeah. Um and particularly the food uh, of our ancestors documentary. Let's spend a little time here as we close talking about this. This is such an important documentary. And as we were talking about at the beginning of the program, obviously this is not an issue that is limited to the United States. So what are some of the things that you saw with this documentary? What is it that you hope to bring to light? Yeah, The Food of Our Ancestors is the second part of a two-part documentary series. So the first documentary, which comes out this month, is called Grounded in My Roots. And that one was a documentary that our film crew really felt needed to be made. It's just really about how I discovered food as medicine and my own connection to my own ancestry. So I am... Indian, so South Asian Indian. I am African. I was born in a tiny little village in Malawi, Africa that has no plumbing, no electricity. Um, and that's where I come from. And then I was raised in Canada and I have an Austrian father. So that's my background, my culture. And so the food of our ancestors, it's really about you connecting to your ancestry before colonization and really exploring what are the foods that you used to eat and what you'll discover actually it doesn't matter what culture you are from what your heritage is what language you speak what part of the world you were born in there's a high probability that 99.9 percent .9 of us were all eating an abundance of plant-based whole food okay an abundance of it and not this you know paleo um BS, forgive me for saying that, but paleo BS that we were all meat eaters because we know that is not true. We know that actually what fueled us were those high carb, beautiful foods provided by nature in abundance, whether it grew on a tree or a bush or in the ground, underneath the ground. Um, you know, we were eating predominantly plant strong foods. That's what fueled us. And so the food of our ancestors is my journey across Canada, running and biking across Canada to meet with Indigenous members, Indigenous communities communities, BIPOC communities, to really have these conversations about the foods that we used to eat. Because I can educate you to your blue in the face and tell you to eat chard and ginger and potatoes and squash. But if it doesn't connect with you, then you're not most likely going to make those changes, especially because we've been taught by a lot of our medical professionals that diet has nothing to do with our disease. We've been raised, if you're alive today, that's probably what you've been fed for a really long time. So it's about undoing that mindset, having that paradigm shift, and actually just realizing your ancestors knew what to eat. So let's get you to tap into that, no matter what culture you're from. Amen to that. Now, uh, when, when does that first documentary come out again? Yeah, Grounded in My Roots. It's 20-minute short doc, so that's coming out this month, but it's just out in the film festivals right now, so we have to just wait before we can release that to the public. And then The Food of Our Ancestors will be covering my bike run tour across Canada, which happens next summer, and that's also um, covering me meeting with the communities across Canada, so that'll be out in 2024. Ooh, okay. Well, that gives yeah. us something to look forward to. You know what could be fun is if you and I could check in a couple of times as you're biking all the way across the country just to see how things are going and get a, get a little bit of a real-time update. Oh, I'd love to do that. We were supposed to go this year, and actually we were supposed to have done it 2021, now again 2022, but because of COVID, it got postponed. Um, and so just, you know, hoping that, um, you know, everything goes well, we will definitely do that check. 
Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And what I'll go ahead and do is make sure that there are links to uh, the, the documentary in the uh, show description here. Um, sure. At the very least, you know, the trailer's out right now. So um, go ahead, do that. We'll get off to your social media where undoubtedly you're going to have 18 million links to everything. So bottom line is <laughs> everybody's going to be covered. Everybody will be covered. Yeah. You, <laughs> you'll get, get on the wait list. So you're the first to know, because we'd love to do a screening if you're in your community and with the short doc as well, because we have an education package that goes along with that short doc to help you start understanding that relationship between food and your body, learn about the different things that you can do to help other communities that live in food deserts. Um, we're about soil regeneration. That's the first thing that needs to happen because you know, if you know all the work that Dr. Zach Bush is doing, you know that you can go to a land that, you know, you can't grow a stick of anything. And within two growing cycles, you can be growing an abundance of, you know, beautiful food. So that's one of the first things that need to happen. So these are all the things that we're going to be uh, sharing and teaching about through the Grounded in My Roots documentary. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I can't think of a single city on the face of the earth that can't get something from that documentary. I mean, there's there's just so much help that is needed. So uh, thank you for stepping up and, and you know, starting, well, continuing the push. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of good people doing that hard work. And, and you and your team are certainly uh, among them out in front of it. So it has just been a real joy talking to you today. Continue to be Wonder Woman, a Renaissance woman, and doing everything that you possibly can um, because you are, you are the person, Nicolette, who I have no doubt uh, when their time is near will have zero regrets of, oh, I should have done more. Nope. Mm. I don't see how you possibly could do any more than you're doing right now. I really hope that that is the case. My ultimate dream is to have a richer health hospital in every state and community, uh, every province across North America. And so that's my biggest dream. So this is all in service of that huge dream. So I just pray that, you know, I keep my body strong and healthy enough to get to that place where I can realize that. Hey man, dreams are what keep us moving. So keep exactly. on going, keep on thank moving. You. Thank you. Nicolette, thank you so very much for being here. Thanks Chuck. Always a pleasure being on your show. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.